first of all, uh, thanks everyone for coming on this very hot um, evening. <laughs> Um, later on, um, we're going to have some refreshments on drinks at the terrace, uh, so please bear with. I am particularly excited today as uh, I have been joined with uh, three amazing filmmakers from Latin America, uh, two longtime friends and now a new friend, uh, Toki. Um, well, um, so today we're gonna we're gonna have a, a brief uh, conversation discussion on the modern Latin American cinema, but specifically we're gonna look through it from the films that we are gonna see later on at Casa. So each filmmaker they're gonna give us their their own point of view on on the. Um, the cinema in their own countries, how is it linked with the whole Latin America, but they're gonna talk to us through their fantastic films that you will be able to see later on. Um, just, just a bit of context, uh, there's been a renewed interest on, on Latin America film industry, and this has opened the paths to so many filmmakers and also audiences around the world who are avid to to experience uh, what is it that we live in in foreign countries. Uh, productions like, uh, like the ones coming from Latin America provide us with a particular reflex from um, social, uh, political, and um, well, the whole ambience of, of the Latin American countries. The promotion of Latin American, country, uh, Latin American cinema abroad is an important cultural tool. It's an opportunity to show to the world a slice of our societies and our circumstances, our, the beauty of our countries, and also our own realities. Cinema um, is a window to see and to be seen through the lens of filmmakers, like the ones that have joined us today. Through their films, we can explore issues um, like gender and sexuality, um, migration, and economic and political problems. We're thrilled to be hosting this, uh, this conversation with uh, our very special guests. So um, with no further ado, I'm gonna introduce them in order. Here's my friend, Gonzalo Massa. Gonzalo Massa is an award winner Chilean screenwriter, director, and producer. Um, he's got a new film, Ella es Cristina. <coughs> Um, that is coming up, so keep an eye. He brought with director Sebastián Lelio four of his films, Navidad, El Año del Tigre, Gloria, that has just been uh, remade with um, Julianne Moore, it's available at Corson, and A Fantastic Woman, um, both in official competition at the Berlin Film Festival, a Fantastic Woman went to win the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film at the Oscars in 2018. As a screenwriter, Gonzalo Massa has been awarded with a Silver Bear uh, for Best Screenplay for A Fantastic Woman at the Berlin Film Festival. Uh, currently, Gonzalo is uh, releasing AJS Christina, as I just mentioned, um, and he's based in London. Some applause for him, please. <laughs> Then joining us is Laura Plancarte. Laura lives and works in London, making films and visual arts. That's her background. Her work has been exhibited in museums and cultural spaces in Mexico City, Guadalajara, Barcelona, and London. She works all over the place. In 2006-2007, uh, she was awarded with uh, the BNP um, grant. And she's also been sponsored by Mexican cultural institutions like La Colección Cumex, La Colección Centro Histórico from UNAM. In 2015, she presented her first feature film, Tierra Caliente, at the Guadalajara Film Festival and at Raindance in London. Um, Talks Against Gravity and won Best Feature Film at the World of Film International Festival in Glasgow. Hermanos Siblings, which is the film that we are presenting at CASA, is her second feature documentary that won the Audience Award uh, for best, to Best Documentary at San Antonio Film Festival, and she is currently working on her next film. 
And last but not least, we have Tuki. Tuki was born and raised in Venezuela from a German father and French mother and Russian grandparents, that's me, right? Uh, he holds a bachelor degree in film and TV from NYU and a master's in business administration from Instituto de Estudios Superiores de Administración. Um, after film school, he directed and produced several short films. Uh, he's, been, he's won several awards at international film festivals. His work as assistant director in film advertising in Venezuela and in Europe and work for TV commercials. He won the Grand Prix of Venezuelan Advertising Awards. He retired from filmmaking and worked in a traditional family business. But well, after eight years without shooting, um, he came back and decided to go on filmmaking. Her first feature-length documentary, Está Todo Bien, which is the film that we're presenting, it premiered at Sheffield Dog Fest. It also uh, went to Guadalajara Film Festival as well. The other one, all right, <laughs> and was included uh, was in the best uh, of fest category at the prestigious uh, documentary festival in Amsterdam, and has since won since since then won numerous awards. He relocated to Berlin, and now is working on a new documentary to battle uh, the legalization of assisted suicide. Big round of applause. So I'm going to stop talking. Uh, we're going to roll the mics. Uh, but first, I'm going to start with Gonzalo. Um, I want each of you to tell us um, about the film that we're presenting in particular, but also how is that linked with your national cinema, and how is that linked? How do you see the whole Latin American spectrum? Uh, well, Fantastic Woman is, um, is the fourth film that uh, I, I co-write with uh, Sebastian Lemieux. And it's a, it's a film that we were working for three years in the script. And, um, and basically, we wanted to tr address uh, different subjects uh, that we were we wanted to we wanted to discuss in Chilean society. Um, of, of course, the most the most um, clear thing is the transgender uh, community in Chile, uh, because the main character uh, is Daniela Vega. Uh, she she's in, she's an actress, a transgender actress, and. and is a force of nature in a way because she's not only an amazing actress, uh, but also she also is a, it's a, a very is like a leader in a way, a political leader in the sense of like actually because of the film, the law regarding gender issues and gender identity in Chile change. So we. we in the context of the Chilean cinema, um, can we roll the mic? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Do I speak about the film or just say the name? Just say the name. Um, roll the mic, and then we're gonna play. Ah, okay. Hermanos siblings. This does it. Just the touch. Guide us for your film. Uh, you want to say a little more? Uh, okay, I, just, I didn't understand, I'm sorry. Okay, um, Hermanos is a film about immigration between Mexico and the US, and it's, I think, a different perspective because it's a film that tells the story from characters from, the, from Mexico and from the US. So basically, you are going to be able to see the complexity of immigration, but through a mirror between the two countries. So what I wanted to aim by making the film is actually building a bridge instead of a wall. So I worked with two uh, Mexican brothers that went illegally to the US five times until they were deported for life, but still wanted to go back. 
with a mirror with a, an American ex beauty queen from Montana who was a Trump, a Trump supporter. And what I realized is that all of the cards were searching for the same thing, a better life. And for all of the characters, it's a mirage because neither of them are going to get what they're looking for in this kind of absolutely state of happiness by just going to the US or by having Trump. And that's the film. Está todo bien, which means it's all good, is a film about the Nile, about uh, the denial in Venezuela of the crisis that has been going on for many years. Only recently it's been in international news and people are talking about it, but it's really been developing for the last decade at least. And the film was shot in 2016. So before sanctions, before a migration crisis, before uh, all of this. And it's basically, it's, the focus is on the medicine shortage and scarcity and what people do in, in those situations. Good, so now we're gonna play the trailers. <coughs> Montana is that beautiful fresh water 
There's no wags pounding you. You don't have to be on guard.
Great, great. Well, um, I mean, I have I have many questions. Um, this, these three films, they um, each each single film has uh, so much to talk about. Um, and after, we're gonna have some space for a Q and A. Um, but first, I'm gonna ask Gonzalo, um, how do you come up with this story? Um, we see. Um, the, the, the center, the center of the story, Marina, a uh, transgender woman. Um, how is, how is uh, still the society uh, behaving with, uh, with transgender people and how, w what does this film represent to the transgender community and the liberation of sexuality um, in Chile? That's three questions. That's three questions. <laughs> Um, um, well, basically, we uh, we didn't start it with a transgender main character. That was the first thing. Uh, we we wanted to make a film about someone who was rejected by. Um, I mean, the, the main character at the beginning was uh, a woman who was the lover of this this, this main character, Orlando, and. <coughs> And she was hated by the family after after he died in her bed because she was the lover and, and this guy had um, a, a family like a very conservative family in Chile. So, but uh, we, we this is a co-writing with the director of San Leonio, and so we were discussing a lot about why she was being hated so much for. Uh, um, by the family, so we were saying, okay, maybe because she she's from a different class, maybe it's because she is a different age, or maybe she's an immigrant, or but nothing like really um, uh, was sounded right for us. And at some point, we realized that uh, we discovered actually that uh, out of the sudden that. Uh, the transgender community in Chile, and, and then I realized it's not only a Chile thing, it's everywhere. It's a very small community, and people react very differently to transgender people when in, in, in social events, or um, it's not like they We realized that if there is a, a transgender person in some, some party, people will try to, like they feel fascinated by them, and at the same time, they want to like, like they don't know really who they are, and and that was a fascinating point of view for a character because we 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 thought okay maybe she's she's the other you know she's the the, the stranger, and and it's a great way to introduce a character and to introduce this subject this theme in in, in a film. So, and, but, but at the same time, and we were very ashamed that we didn't know anyone like that. We didn't have a transgender friend or something to talk about that. So we did the research, and, 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 and when we were doing the research, we, find, we found uh, um, Daniela, Daniela Deva, the main actress. At the beginning, she was a consultant for the film, and, and then she became the actress for the film. Because she's an actress, she was doing like theater uh, plays and, and in Chile. So basically, that was the, the 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 how how we found the story, how we connect the story we already had, and how we put a different <coughs> character in the middle of the story and made a lot of sense. It was like the missing part, the missing piece that we were looking for for a long time. And when we put it there, it was like, now everything makes sense in the story. Um, and regarding the, the consequences or like what happened with the film in Chile, well, of course, at the beginning, uh, well, the first, the film was shown in, 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 in Berlinale first. And we got an award for best screenplay, and we got that got a lot of attention for the film in Chile. So when we showed the film in Chile, in a way, it was protected for the international status of the film, which is very, it's very. I don't know if you have the same, the same, the same thing, but it's, but it's very, 
common than in Latin America. If you got awards outside the Latin American circuit, people say, oh, this man must be at the film. Because it's like, they don't trust. Like, you show directly the film to them, they say, hmm, I don't know. But, uh, so in a way, the, f the festival circuit is very important in a way to protect our films, to, to keep something for our audiences, actually. Uh, in, that, in this case, we, feel, we felt that, and, and it was really good for the film, but not only for the film, it was really good for the, for the theme, for the issue that we were addressing, the, the acceptance of the transgender community in Chile. It was, the f for the first time, a transgender uh, character in a Chilean film, and a transgender actress in a Chilean film. And she, as, as you can see, she's fantastic. She's like, she's in the middle of this film, and she's like flamboyant and like, you know, it's, it's a superstar. So I think for people in Chile it was like, uh, it, was, it was a way to accept, accept the, the community. And, and in a way that happened with the film. It's very interesting what you just mentioned that um, when, when the film travels abroad and it receives the international attention, it comes back as protected, no? Um, it's happened to many films, no? Um, I can think of, of, of many uh, of many cases, um, but um, but that's exactly what maybe happened to to both of your films, no? Both of your films, um, um, as documentaries, you touch very um, very difficult topics, you ex um, expose some uh, problems, some social problems that we are living in Latin America, um, and possibly it was um, more well received with the international audience. Um, what what was your experience? Let's let's start with you, Laura. What was your experience on um, presenting siblings abroad? Thank you. Um, well, I think it was very interesting for me to present it um, in Mexico and in the U.S. specifically because obviously it's very close to those countries even though that immigration I think is the biggest problem today everywhere. And what for me paid off as a filmmaker is that when I presented the film in Mexico, people in Mexico were autocritic. They went, they didn't go after the American um, character, they didn't go after Vanessa. And everybody questioned, why is everybody in Mexico wanting to leave? And what are we going to do about it? And that for me was very, very important. And then, when I present the film in the United States, people were not against the Mexican brothers. People actually really, for the audience, obviously, we need to take in consideration that the audience that attends festivals in the US is obviously a liberal audience. So for them, it was very difficult to swallow a character like Vanessa and to accept that that's happening in their own country. And for them, at the end, they said, we are happy to watch the film because there's lots of films about the Trump era. And people also, you can do that sometimes with documentaries, you sacrifice them, the, the, the characters, and I don't believe in that kind of work, I don't believe in sensationalism, they are real people, and I don't think it brings anything to the conversation and we have enough. And the reason I chose Vanessa is because I actually like her. I could communicate with her, so I said, I don't agree with her, but if I can communicate with her, people that don't agree with her will listen. And people in the audience actually were autocritic of what was happening in the US, but they could also accept that the US is polarized and divided, and they need to speak between themselves in order to be able to have a dialogue also with Mexico. But it was a great response because I think both countries, instead of just blaming the other country, the response I got that people were reflective of what of, of themselves, and that for me was what really, really paid off of making that film. 
Well, in, in, this, in the case of Estado Bien, it was, uh, it was premiered uh, exactly a year ago in England. So in June, in, in last year in Sheffield, and it's been shown in many festivals for, I mean, for 12 months it's been running and, and it was never shown in Venezuela until just uh, also a month ago. It was shown one time, just once, and uh, the reason is that no cinemas really dared to show the film in the current situation. So there was actually last year a, f a festival that wanted to show it, but all the cinemas said, no, we're, we don't want to show the film. Uh, it's too risky. And, and this year, uh, it was like sort of hidden beneath like a selection of many other films, and then it was shown just once. And uh, so I don't, I, I, I wish it would be shown more. I think there's a group of students who want to show it at universities, and universities are a little more protected in that sense. My experience has been, or the feedback I got from the people in Venezuela who saw it, is that it's harder for people in Venezuela to see because they're still going through this. So for people abroad, it's uh, for Venezuelans abroad who have family, it's also hard. But then I've had experiences. <coughs> Two weeks ago, uh, I showed it in Shanghai to a Chinese audience at the Shanghai International Film Festival, and I asked the programming director, "Why did you select the movie?" and she was very bold and it's a government funded festival and she said a lot of the films we choose get censored or and and this is a film that shows something that's happening in china but it's so far away it will not be censored and actually that was also the feedback i got from the audience was like some people were thinking and saying oh this makes me think about what's happening in my own country so i think film is a great way like what you were saying to raise consciousness and maybe make people think about their prejudices or problems they have in their own countries. What, let's, let's stay with me. What, what made you tell uh, <coughs> this story? What was your impulse? So my impulse, my, my motivation was that I was at the time still living in Venezuela. I was seeing the collapse of a country uh, that was vertiginous. It was just going so fast and sliding down the, 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 the hill and getting worse and worse and then when people were uh, um, that uh, very close people were saying I, I don't find any insulin anymore for diabetes or I don't find uh, my cancer treatment or I don't find anything for uh, my hemophilia it was just so outrageous to me at the time to think that it's such a rich country would be in such a situation and just seeing the crisis but at the same time seeing the denial, which is not the case anymore, now the government is recognizing, but at the time, there was, at the same time we started shooting, the, the uh, health minister of Venezuela did an international PR tour uh, uh, to praise the best uh, healthcare system in the world, which is Venezuela's for her. So this, this um, huge, contrast between what the official narrative was and what I was seeing on the ground. It's what led me to do the film and also to do it the way I did it, which presents it as a, as a stage. Uh, so I wanted to play with the denial and, and sort of turn it around and so the actors are pretending it's a stage play, but it's not. <coughs> um. I have a question for the three of you. What, in your opinion, what is the filmmaker's responsibility to show these stories um, to our own societies and, and to the world? What, what is it that you as a person, using a camera, being, being able to tell stories, um, what sense of responsibility does one have? Um, uh, I think cinema it's it's like the psychologist of societies in the sense that uh, in cinema we discuss that, that things that maybe sometimes are really in your face are really are really clear but actually we don't think that much about that and, and when you're watching a film that 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 really makes you think 
you, it's not because it's not only in the logical way. It's actually because it's activating something in your head that you didn't know that you care, that you didn't know that you it was important for you, or or activate some emotions inside of you that you think that are 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 pivotal in your life, and out of a sudden because you're watching a film, now you know, and that individual reaction to a film. It's beautiful when it's not only individual, it's, it's all as a community reacting to a film. And I think, I don't know if we have um, responsibilities, I don't want to film, I don't want to, to think about film in, the, in, in, that, in that terms, uh, because if you, if you are aware of your responsibilities, then maybe you're not making films. <laughs> but um, uh, I think that uh, basically, maybe our drive, it's, it's or, or, or at least I think, especially in Latin America, in terms of identity, who, we, who are we, and what we want from, well, actually the main question, who are we? Because it's a very young continent, and, and it's, it's trying to, to activate that, in, not only in the, in the audience, but also in ourselves, in, 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 in the female. So yeah, I think that that would be, that would be my first my answer. Great, great answer. I do think it's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Um, so I shared most of um, what Gonzalo just said, <coughs> and I think I like very much what you said about the psychologist of society because. And that it is it's tricky to talk about your responsibility because there is obviously ethical issues and more when you're obviously working with real people, but there's also a, com a commitment as a filmmaker, and I think you also need to be true to yourself in a way because if not, then the psychology of society will fail and there would be no more cinema. And I think the beauty of cinema uh, is exactly that it's able to tell you something without making it a lesson or, or something didactic. It's also, I think, having the mystery of leaving the audience to make their own mind because we are also not in the position to tell you this is the truth and you should follow it because we don't have it. I think what we can do is question things and bring them and it's up to you of what you make out of them. Yes, I, I, I don't think uh, there's a responsibility. I don't like to think either in the terms of responsibility. I think maybe every one of us has a responsibility to himself. And as a filmmaker, you also have a responsibility to yourself. And how do you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning? And, um, and that. I think that might be a driving force for everyone in, in what we do, regardless whether it's film or something else. Now, uh, in terms of um, the whole concept of Latin American cinema, uh, you were saying that we, um, we struggle on, on trying to find our own identities. Who are we as countries and who are we as a conglomeration of countries, so-called uh, Latin America. Um, I, I'm the, of the opinion that uh, cinemas, they, they need to be considered separately, but also um, in this case, um, it is a whole, no? That somehow we, we have a, a unique voice and programmers and festivals and audiences around the world they, they see that, they, they can really feel when a film comes from Latin America, at least in my opinion. Um, what is it for you, um, this so-called Latin America cinema, and what has your film contributed? Uh, in this, uh, um, I think that we have, uh, we have some kind of, uh, how can I say this, uh, the, the image that the war, or maybe the, actually the uh, Europe and the States has about, uh, they have about Latin America. It's like basically 
a lot of stereotypes, you know, like you know, the narcos, it's the first one, the, the poor people in the streets, and, the, and all this, like, you know, they call the Garcia Marquez, you know, magical realism, and all that, you know. Um, and I think that now we're living in, in, in a world that you really need to show the real, the real, real Latin America, which is very different from these images that we have. I mean, I never met a, a narco in my life. I never, I never seen a narco. I mean, <laughs> well, it depends. It depends. But uh, or like. Um, I don't know, it's just all these images that, that, that are, are present in the world and regarding Latin America, I really hate that images. And I, I don't feel attached or like, I don't have any connection with these images. So the first thing in my head when I'm trying to make a film is like, try, how can it change that? How can it do something that is completely in the other side of this, of this, um, in, in, you know, Cliches or like this, this, this country or this, this space of, of, of the stereotype that I really, I, I don't feel that it shows anything that is connected with us. So I don't know if, if we, I mean, I mean that's a, that's again a driving force. It's again something that okay, say so okay, now I'm gonna do something that is completely in the other side, and I think that's that, that's good. And, I, and I, sometimes I feel that festivals and audiences in Europe and the States are, are waiting for that kind of stories and characters and stuff. They don't want to see a game again. It's actually good to come after Gonzalo because Gonzalo <laughs> says it really well. <laughs> it's like very, very. I completely agree. I think there's much more. Uh, about Latin America than just those images and when we portray usually Mexico is portrayed by Americans it's even sepia, color sepia is a different color so it's um, I think we need to get away with that and that doesn't mean losing our Latin American identity or our Mexicality in my case and for me what you say is for me brings the example that we could be in this time of cinema they would be like when Tamayo appeared after three muralists in Mexico, and he said, Mexicality can be in the colors and in something that it's more in the unconscious and dream that not necessarily for being Mexican you need to paint the murals. And I think it's exactly like what Gonzalo is saying. I think also we're living in a global world and it's a connection between us. And one thing that, that I think I'm sure with Tuki and with Gonzalo has happened is like you want to see also the Latin American magic, that real magic. Go and watch a team of Latin American people work on a film because they will make it happen, regardless of anything. And that's where you see the Latin American spirit, I think, most of all. Yeah, I, I think also one thing is obviously it's the language, the common language from Mexico to Argentina. Of course, Brazil is a whole almost a continent to itself. And, but I think that common language makes, I mean, there's an identity in language and, and it obviously creates a, a, a culture that is very, I mean, even though there's differences in every country, there's something that unites them. Also growing up on very, a lot of the um, Mexican TV shows, you know, like, Latin Americans grow up with a chavo or I don't know if it's still the case, but but uh, <coughs> so I think that makes obviously uh, and then I agree with Gonzalo. There's all kind. I mean, there's you can't really say there's one type of. Uh, there's sometimes you can see like a tendency from a group of Mexican filmmakers or Argentina where you can see some similarities because they come from the same school or they believe in the same type of filmmaking, but. You have all kinds of genres, really, in types of filmmaking, and I think that's great. And, but I think you can say the same thing for Asia or uh, for Europe, and for I mean, it's. I totally agree. We have to see Latin American cinema as a whole spectrum of genres. We have documentaries. We have a narrative, and we have drama. We have comedy. We have 
all sorts of films that it's not just um, one genre, the Latin American cinema, there is a whole spectrum. Um, we show what's happening in our countries, but we also aim to remove cliches and stereotypes, because um, the so-called European guilt, you know, that mm -hmm. some films, they fit the system and they show the next Amores Perros, mm -hmm. and you're like, yes, but what's next, you know, like, I'm sure there is a uh, color in your country, I'm sure there is a love story, I'm sure there is something else, no? And that's, that's, very, um, that's very gorgeous to show as well. Um, I think we have, um, we're going to open the mic to the audience. Um, I'm sure we have some questions. We have a couple of questions if you have. You can raise your hands. I think there is some uh, rolling mic. Is that? And then uh, at the beginning, I would tend to like cut too quickly or or go away too quickly or not stay, and then it created some problems when I started editing the first one. And then I realized I need to stay longer and, and let the scenes develop. And it's not like when you're working with actors. And that was for me was uh, something I learned and and that I I try to. Um, work on now every time when I shoot is really to develop that patience. For me it is a big thing, I think because I come from visual arts, so for me the, the thinking of how it's going to be the film visually, it, it, it's, it's very, very important. And um, in this film, Emanus, for me one of the things I always think is that Usually we don't remember things in like a medium shot, like this. I think when we remember things, we actually remember a detail of a person or something, or we remember a whole situation. So I like to think, for example, of close-up and really wide shots. So even though I'm working documentary, I like to plan and be ready and have, I work usually with two cameras, so I can do reverse shots and be able to have a scene that I can cut in between. And the, the, the color and the texture also, uh, in this film, for example, I wanted that they become exactly the same color, so there was no difference in, in Mexico and the US, even though it's very different, but trying to make it more come together than trying to make it divided. And it is for me something that it's very important because at the end is the way um, it's part of how we are going to express what's happening. So I like um, I like to work and I like to also create a lot of kind of more poetic, abstract kind of shots that takes you into something more about what the characters feel than what they say in order to not have just like talking heads or things like that. <laughs> Hello, my name is Angie, and uh, I would like to have a particular question about the language of the films, uh, regarding especially uh, the point uh, of the invitation um, about the films will be more openness to foreign language films. So I would like to know if uh, your films have already uh, sell to another non Latin America, uh, non non Spanish uh, language, and uh, if you feel what do you feel about the their audience if they prefer uh, uh, subtitle if they prefer dubbing or it's like how to introduce the Latin American films for the now known Spanish uh, countries, uh, languages, sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I, well, so regarding the, um, the subtitles thing, the, the thing I want to ask Ram and answer your question because it, it's it's funny. I'm I'm I came here to study screenwriting after being a screenwriter for for films uh, because I wanted to be a screenwriter in English uh, for 
But the reason is because I, I, I really like English language. I really like the way they express actions. And I think it's a very good language for screenwriting. So that's the, re the main reason I did it. And, and then I direct the film. And I, I was very, my main concern were, were, were the subtitles. I want, because I, I was a writer, so I wanted to do the, the, the specific subtitles for my film because I knew there were some nuances, some specific wording in my film that I wanted to put it in English in the right way. I really enjoyed the process. And then I, I wonder, that never happens. That never happens that the, the, there is no involvement between the writer of the film and the subtitle of the film, but most of the time, because not all the writers are bilingual. But, but the truth is, like, it's so much important to express, I mean, when you want to express, when you, when you write a script, to express something, and then you watch your own film with subtitles in English, and no, it's not that, it's a completely different film. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's maybe one of the reasons some, sometimes people are not really attached or not, not really want to watch films sometimes, because it's, it's, it's kind of strange. It's, they're not getting exactly what they're saying. And actually, people even, I don't know if it's like that, but I think sometimes people don't really get what is the film with subtitles. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. Uh, I just want to add, I think dubbing is horrible. And I think subtitles are always better than dubbing. I mean, there are some countries that still dub, and I think that's horrible because I think the voice of an actor is part of the performance, and when you dub, you're killing it. <coughs> In my case, yes, it's been shown, and always with subtitles, never dubbed. <laughs> It's not always bad, like Italians usually dub films and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but like for example the other films, he was glad that they were dubbed. He said oh, they're even better in Italian than in <laughs> So I, I mean I, I don't think it's always <laughs> because Oreste Gionello was a very good actor and uh, so I don't I don't know, it's not the rule, I think. If it's a documentary, obviously it cannot be done. But maybe mm, fiction can be can work. I sure want to add something. I think you're right. I mean, the dubbing can make a film better or worse. I think the problem is that it's a process where usually the filmmakers are not involved with. And so, I mean, maybe there's a great Italian dubber, but would the Allen have control over him or how he would do his voice or the director? I don't know. Hi, so um, all three of you have done films that there is a specific social issue in your um, countries of origin. Have you considered going beyond that in in themes that are more reflective of things that are happening across the globe? So, for example, I understand that in Chile, uh, transgender is an issue. For us in Venezuela, it's the medicine shortage and immigration in Mexico. But have you considered exploring beyond your own countries those those themes? I'm making at the moment a film in Montana, USA, about um, contemporary cowboys and Indians. So, yes. <laughs> um, I think that um, we, you need to balance between what, 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 is, what is particular of your country and what is a universal thing. And I think that that balance, when you find balance, is really good because it feels local at the same time rings a bell in audiences, audiences everywhere. So uh, it's not like you're choosing themes when you're making films. 
that case, at least you're, you're, you're making characters, and then because of the characters, you, you're finding things. Uh, but yes, definitely, definitely it's, it's good to, to find things that are universal, and, and actually that's a good way to, to find audiences everywhere. Yes, me too. I mean, I think uh, it's always, uh, in, in my case, I, I don't want to uh, do films only about uh, in Venezuela, or, but obviously it's something that is very important to me, and so I had the opportunity now to go back and shoot again, and uh, if I can keep on doing it, I'd love to keep on doing it, but at the same time, I don't want to be like in a, uh, put in a cupboard or something and do just, just that. Time for one last question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, just to finish up this, you know, question about the the, the themes and the, you know how universal they are. I think that immigration is just such a main issue right now that you know it's like and also transgender. I mean, this is what we're all talking about. Main film, most film are talking about this issue. So I guess that it's definitely goes over the country and it's definitely. It goes everywhere. Anyway, coming back to, I want to ask a question to Gonzalo, because I'm, I'm really attracted by Chilean film, cinema in general, and so I just wanted to, to find out, because I've met so many different directors, like Dominguez Sotomayor, I met Marcela, Saeed, and I met, you know, many, uh, Daniel Ampid, etc. I'm just wondering, uh, is there something special about Chilean film? Because right now, it's, it's really like they're coming up with so many original ideas, so many different films compared to, you know, I'm talking about Latin America at the moment, so. Well, uh, we were repressed for a long time, so <laughs> out, of the, out of the sudden explode, you know, because, uh, well, we had a dictatorship uh, for a long time, but besides that, it's not only that, it's, it's because um, there is, uh, they always say that there is new waves, you know, there is a new wave on cinema, and this is, uh, the people say a lot about there is a new wave on children cinema. And, uh, and I think what happens is it's, it's a very, it's a small, very interconnected community of filmmakers, and we know each other a lot, and we, we share a lot of like, like, I mean, if I'm making a film, I have a friend who's a filmmaker, and, and he, you know, this, this filmmaker watch my film, and actually, I'm, I'm working now with Marcela Said in her next film, so it's like, we're, we're very interconnected. I think, I think that one of the reasons for having so, uh, a lot of children films in the world out of the, out of the sudden is because um, it's, uh, it, you get a sense of community. I mean, uh, David uh, David was, was saying uh, that, like, when you find you, you realize that there is actually the, the same actors right, in all the films. So it's like uh, it's like a small group, you know, a small group of people making many films. And we did, but the good thing is, like, we have very different directors, filmmakers, and 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 documentary filmmakers, and there is a lot of. Uh, visions with our very different. So it's, it, even as like we are a small community, we don't think the same, we don't think alike. No, 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 yeah, we're no, very different. No, yeah. yeah, but it comes from repression, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one last question, yeah. <laughs> Actually, well, I'm not a specialist for, sorry, I'm Jeffrey, I'm with uh, Um I'm not a specialist, an expert in Latin films, but uh, I've enjoyed so much what we've been saying, it's been really electrifying, and most enjoyable. And uh, Gonzalo, you've uh, mentioned about reality, and in the way these films have been drawn out here, in the reality area, it seems to me. I'm so pleased that you mentioned humour. And it's, you know, my experience in Latin America is, with all the contrasts and the changes, it's a lot of humor. People laugh. You know, if you look at the three of you, you'd be laughing, you'd be smiling. And I'm certain you mentioned comedies. And I think this, uh, to me, strikes me this is an area of a vein of richness you could exploit. And I think the world so interested in good comedies, and people will go to international comedies where they can't understand the language, because it's a great vehicle for acting. And, uh, you know, we get some really good French ones. But I'm sure there's a potential to learn that. Well, so much to hear from the three of you, you know, what we should go and see and what the potential is. And if any of you have some plans to do some comedy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned because I did a comedy. The, the film I directed is a comedy. Uh, the, it's not. Uh, it's, it's not out. I mean, it's still it's still looking for a release, but um, but but it's very hard to find uh, space in international cinema for comedies because people want to see dramas and uh, suffer. Especially from, from, especially from Latin America. We don't want to see, like, yeah. life is beautiful, you know, whatever, like, you know, like, we're having a good time. And, um, it's true. It's true. And it's the same with the documentaries. Like, if you, if you, if you, so it's, it's, it's not, that's the reason that you don't find that much comedies in the international cinema. Uh, maybe you don't find a drama with a dark humor. Which is very, you know, like Gerald Lagimos, you know, that kind of that humor. You can find dramas, but actual comedies. And actually, and the other thing is, the other reason is because many comedies are for the local market, so with very specific jokes that you only get if you're from that country, and that happens a lot in Mexican cinema and you know, in in Latin cinema, in Chilean cinema. All the the the, the, the hits. Audience are comedies, but if you're from a different country, even from Latin America, you don't get any of the jokes because are very local. So try to make comedies that can travel, or they have like a, they can find a different audience outside your own country. It's, it's difficult. I think it's even difficult for here, like actually, you know, British. Well, this place is not a place, but you know, French comedies are not like I don't know if they show. <laughs> There was a, one last question at the back. Hello, Carmen. Yeah. Um, Latin America is so diverse, so big, so each country is so different between each other. Uh, what do you think are the things uh, Latin America has in common besides the language to be called Latin America cinema? Mm -hmm. Besides the language, what do we have in common? Oh, many things. You see, I think um, we have, um, Jeffrey from the front that just said that we laugh, you know. I think there is something for me is that we make it happen. Um, they could have archetypes about us that, you know, we are narcos or, you know, lazy or all those kind of things. But I think one of the things is that when you have a Latin American crew, it doesn't matter if it's Mexican or Chilean or Venezuelan or Colombian, you'll find a way. And we are, because of the countries we come from, we're used to not working with those huge budgets. So if the huge budget is not there in place, we will make it happen anyway. And that is something that is resilience and I think of, um, I don't know, uh, we just, it's camaraderie and a very, I'm very proud of being Latin America. Mm -hmm. yeah, we are poor. <laughs> Maybe the music, even even like we have very specific music with very different ones from one country to another. It's the, the music it, we share this sense of dancing, constant dancing, you know. So yeah, yeah. I think there's also a mixed heritage. I mean that and, uh, and the mix of races. So you have, of course, the Spanish heritage, and who were the 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 culture that colonized the, the continent and that's very strong but then you also have indigenous influence and you have African influences in, in part of Latin America and then the mix of the, all those three uh, with all the different ways you can mix them up so I think those things make it 
uh, it's very unique to Latin America, and you can see it in the in the food and the cinema and the literature and the art, and I think that's something that uh, is definitely unites the the, the culture. Well, good. Well, aren't we proud to be Latin Americans? <laughs> A big round of applause for them, please. <laughs> I have a couple of announcements before I pass the mic to Christina, if I may. Um, Call to an event in London coming up that you should go to. We have a South Social Festival uh, in Saturday. We have a Christine, uh, Dominga Sotomayor film uh, in Elephant and Castle. So if you're in town on Saturday, Elephant and Castle, please go and visit. Uh, we have Casa, of course, uh, from the 16th to the 27th of July. It's in our college theater, Rio Cinema, Dalston, Carve Garden. There are a lot of activities. We have Cordelia, the executive director here. Hello. If you have any questions, and um, I may announcement for Rain Dance Film Festival. Uh, it's, it's of course it's coming up in September from the 18th to 29th. Uh, we have Malika here, one of our senior programmers. Um, if you have a film, pitch it to her. <laughs> um, we have we're gonna have a lot of a lot of Latin American films, uh, Spanish-speaking language uh, films from Brazil. Um, we have a whole combination of films from Latin America, so please come and support. So um, I'll give the mic to Christina. Thank you, thank you for doing all the adverts, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, so be able to find your, your way there. Um, it really just falls to me to say that was a fascinating discussion, uh, as I'm sure you'll, you'll agree, and I hope you very much enjoyed it and, and as I did. A couple of takeaways for me. I mean, one was on the subtitles versus dubbing side. My only contribution to the debate is having watched a number of films made in Spain, where they dub. Um, sounds like the same guys every time, and it gets a bit boring. Um, so that's, that's my only contribution to, to, to the debate. Uh, apart from that, I think we have a bit of a challenge here, Bobby, because um, you know I heard the debate starting about whether humour, thanks to Jeffrey's question, is local or international. I think we should take up that challenge and see what we can what we can find that we might share with it, this good audience on a future occasion. So I'm not going to hide, hide you away from your drinks um, any any longer, except to say that. I want to say a very warm thank you to David, to Gonzalo, to Laura, and to Tuki, who I think have been absolutely fantastic. Um, before we do one final round of applause before we get up from our seats. <laughs> is going to be in the courtyard, which is Canyon House's third summer drinks reception. So you're very welcome to that, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.